Around the time of Halloween, you always see the image of a witch flying across a full moon on her broomstick. Have you ever wondered where that symbol came from? The story starts back in 1692 in a Salem village in the Massachusetts Bay Colony when two young girls, ages 9 and 11, started having fits. The first girl, Elizabeth Paris, daughter of Reverend Samuel Paris, had the first fit, which included seizures, screaming, uttering sentences in a strange language, and also contorting her body in odd ways. The next victim of these fits was a girl named Abigail Williams, niece of Reverend Paris. The Reverend was extremely worried of what could be happening to the girls. Before we go further into the story of the trials, you need to understand the beliefs of the Salem townspeople. Being Puritans, the church always ruled in all civil matters. They believed in the existence of God and his angels, which meant they also believed in the existence of the devil and his demons. The invisible words the Puritans could hear were very real to them, just like the words in the Bible were real. In this time period, it was also believed that men were superior to women. This is known as patriarchy. With this belief, a woman would be more likely to enlist in the devil's service than a man. Another contributing factor was the rumors of witch hunts in Europe in the early 1600s. The news of these hunts eventually spread to the New World. The people of Salem already believed that the devil could give certain people known as witches the power to harm others in return for their loyalty. So after hearing the rumors of the hunts in Europe, the Puritans believed that there must be witches in their own town. Since Salem was such a small town, it was difficult to keep secrets. Reverend Samuel Paris knew he would have to tell someone about the girls' fit soon. The Reverend decided to have the local doctor evaluate the two young girls. The doctor claimed that something of the supernatural world was bothering the girls. Little did the townspeople know, these fits were just the beginning of the biggest tragedy Salem would ever encounter. The next girl, Ann Putnam, age 11, claimed Giles Corey would pinch or prick her with pins. She also complained of the same symptoms of Elizabeth Paris. The girls knew they couldn't fake these fits forever, therefore they decided to accuse three women, Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tituba, for afflicting the pain. Tituba was a slave who didn't have the same beliefs as the Puritans. Sarah Good was poor, and Sarah Osborne rarely attended church. These reasons made the girls easy targets for being accused of witchcraft, since no one would stand up for them. Local magistrates interrogated the women for several days. Tatuba was the only one to confess to being guilty. She said, The devil came to me and bid me serve him. She then began to describe specific images of a black man who wanted her to sign his book. It only took the one confession before many pe people started to accuse their own neighbors. Rebecca Nurse, Giles Corey, Martha Corey, Elizabeth Proctor, Bridget Bishop, and Mary Warren were among the many others accused of witchcraft. Martha Corey was the first to suggest that the young girls made false accusations, which of course brought unwanted attention upon herself. After more arrests were made later, officials John Hathorne and Jonathan Corwin were brought to the town. They were to immediately examine each of the accused witches. The so-called witches became scared of what could happen to them if they continued to deny the accusations. Many of them decided to confess to witchcraft and also started mentioning several alleged accomplices. This, of course, led to more arrest. The first case brought to court was Bridget Bishops. She was found guilty, then hung just a week later on June 10, 1692. Many others went to trial at the beginning of July, where nearly each person was found guilty. Elizabeth Proctor avoided execution by claiming she was pregnant. Another victim, George Burroughs, recited the entire Lord's Prayer before being hung. This was supposedly impossible for a witch, but Cotton Mather, the judge, happened to be present. He informed the crowd that George had already been convicted by the jury. He was indeed guilty. The next person on trial was Giles Corey. He refused to plead guilty, which led to getting himself tortured. He was pressed beneath a heavy load of stones. After all of the pain, he still claimed to be innocent. Two days later, Corey died from his chest being crushed. Even after several witches had been executed, people were still making accusations. The witch hunt gave them excuses to blame anyone. If a neighbor wanted your land, they would accuse you of witchcraft, knowing that you would be killed. Then they could easily claim the land. The judges worried about how they could know who was telling the truth. They couldn't fully depend on the spectral evidence. The entire town of Salem was getting too crazy. You couldn't trust anyone. 
The president of Harvard, Increase Mather, denounced the use of spectral evidence. He said, it were better that ten suspected witches should escape than one innocent person be condemned. Governor Phipps agreed and, it, and decided to release many accused witches. All of the witchcraft charges were overlooked by May 1963. The damage was already done. After the trials, many people, including Judge Sewall, apologized for their errors. In 1711, the colony passed a bill that restored the rights and good names of those who were executed. Their families were granted 600 pounds for compensation. The state of Massachusetts did not formally apologize until 1957, almost 250 years later. In this great tragedy, 200 people were accused of practicing witchcraft known as the devil's magic. Of those 200, 20 were executed. This tragedy is one we have learned tremendously from and one that will never be forgotten.